Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Park Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. Coming up on To the Contrary. On the one hand, um, there was definitely a strong belief among some priests that a sale of people was wrong. The idea of owning people, though, perhaps not so wrong. How did that change your view of the church that you still belong to? It's a really interesting question. Welcome to To the Contrary, a weekly discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. This week, the Catholic Church and slavery. We look at the critical role slavery played in the early days of the church in America and how the sale of 272 enslaved people financed the church's expansion. With us today is woman thought leader Rachel Swarns the author of The 272, The Families Who Were Enslaved and Sold to Build the American Catholic Church. Welcome to the program, Ms. Swarns. Thanks so much for having me. All right, so let's start out. Uh, I know the history goes earlier than this, but I'd like to start with the story about the 272 people on the dock in Alexandria, Virginia, in November of 1838. Describe the scene for me, please. Yeah, it's the best way, actually, to bring people into the story. Um, and so if I take you back to November of 1838, and if you were standing there on a wharf uh, near uh, the nation's capital in Alexandria, Virginia, you would have seen them. Scores of people being loaded onto a ship, forcibly loaded. There were elderly people, um, husbands and wives, children. Um, you would have seen frantic parents clinging to their children, babies wailing. And these were, as you point out, enslaved people who were being sold down south, uh, far from the people they loved and the world that they knew. And they had been owned and sold by the nation's most prominent Jesuit priests, who happened to be among the largest slaveholders in Maryland. And when times got tough, they did what a lot of people did, which was sell off their assets. And in this instance, um, it happened to be 272 men, women, and children to help save Georgetown, uh, which was the nation's first Catholic institution of higher knowledge, um, higher learning. And, you know, it was something I happen to be Black and Catholic myself. I'm a reasonably educated person. Um, but I had no idea. And, and when I learned about this, um, I really wanted to tell the story of these families. And what happened to them? You, uh, what amazes me is that you have, and even Georgetown has, I was on their website, uh, contact with all kinds of descendants. So what did they go to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, the, where uh, not that slavery could any ever be anything but cruel, but the most demanding, over-demanding, labor-intensive, whippings-intensive kind of slavery in the country was going on. That's absolutely right. And I hone in on one family in particular um, to bring this, uh, this story to life, the Mahoney family. And, and theirs is a powerful story because it runs parallel to the emergence of Catholicism um, in the um, British colonies and the early United States. Um, and so the story starts with a black woman named Anne Joyce, who's the matriarch of the family who arrives in 1600s, you know, a couple of decades, few decades after the first Catholic priests arrive in Maryland. And she's an indentured servant um, who's uh, forced into slavery and tells her children and grandchildren a story that they pass on to, for generations, this story that her freedom was stolen and theirs as well, and that they should all be free people. And 
as um, she is forced into slavery, several of her descendants are also forced into uh, slavery, the hands of Catholic priests. Um, and, you know, they do all kinds of things. They resist in all kinds of ways, sue the priests. There are descendants who kill an overseer. Um, but by the time of this sale, um, you know, they have learned to try to accommodate themselves to this brutal institution. Um, Harry Mahoney actually saves the church's wealth in 1812 um, and is promised that his family will be spared any sales, but they are broken apart. And, and the priests know just what you talked about, that, you know, the regime in the Deep South, in Louisiana, where these folks are headed, is the most brutal regime um, that exists um, in, you know, the slave society that was the United States at the time. And so you have this inherent contradiction where you have these priests who are, you know, trying and saying that they're nurturing the souls of these people, um, trying to make sure they end up in places where they could continue, you know, their Catholicism, even as they're tearing families apart and selling them. I mean, to me, that just sounds like gall and nerve on an exponential basis that you're, try that you're trying to save someone's soul and yet you as a human being claim that you own that person. D isn't that totally against all, this, all the teachings of Jesus? The priests justified slavery in a lot of ways. It's in the Bible, it's an ancient practice. Um, and Rome did not frown upon the enslavement of people, not the enslavement of black people. And it was, um, as many people point out today, it was legal, right? Um, but um, the truth is that there were voices all along the way among the priests who raised the very points that, you know, the kinds of points that you raise, raising questions about the morality of this, raising concerns about the treatment um, of the folks who they were holding captive. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was really important, as I mentioned, part of the economy, um, and it was important for the, the emergence of the Catholic Church. So the priests um, who ran plantations, um, who relied on slave labor, established really the underpinnings of the, the Catholic Church, not just Georgetown. We're talking about the first archdiocese, um, the first cathedral, uh, helping to establish the some of the early convents, um, even the priests who established the first seminary, first Catholic seminary, were priests who ran a plantation and, and sold people. So this was foundational for the church. And especially in Maryland, which was founded as a state, uh, supposedly for as a sanctuary for Catholics. That's absolutely right. And so those early Catholics who arrived um, in the 1600s came because Maryland was a place um, where they thought they could worship freely. Um, they had been persecuted in England and, and this was meant to be a refuge for them. And that didn't sense, that didn't, they just tossed that out the window and said, <laughs> oh, well, well, this is the American economy and we need to make ruin people's lives, kill them sometimes? So it, in, in, in fairness, we have to, you know, acknowledge that, you know, the Catholics weren't alone here, right? Um, Protestants um, also found ways to accommodate um, slavery and their religious beliefs. Um, and um, it was, if you, you know, remember that these folks were, um, were persecuted, right? And um, and as Maryland ended up being run by Protestants, they faced a raft of discriminatory laws that targeted Catholics. Um, and it, they wanted to be a part and to demonstrate that they were a part of establishment society. And establishment society was, you know, a slaveholding society. Um, and um, 
they were a part of that, even though, as I mentioned, there were lonely voices um, who said, wait a second, you know, and questioned um, and, and, and raised opposition. Please tell the audience about who some of these people were and what they tried to do. The best way to tell that story is to tell you a little bit about two priests who figure importantly in um, this history, particularly in the history of the big sale at Georgetown. One was a priest by the name of Thomas Milady, who ended up being an important um, early president of Georgetown, expanded um, Georgetown, and also an early important leader of the Catholic, um, the Jesuit province of Maryland. And he was a bit of a visionary. What he said was, hey, you know, this church that used to be based in this kind of plantation, um, rural kind of system, that's not the future. The future is in the cities. The future is where all of these thousands of Irish immigrants and German immigrants are coming in. And we need to be there. We need to be able to expand. And to do that, we need money. And here's the way to get it. You know, we need to sell these people. And there were priests who said, absolutely not. We know what the Deep South is like. Um, some of it was, you know, paternalistic, you know, like we need to care for these people. Um, it wasn't an argument, we need to free these people, but that the sale was wrong. Um, and Father Joseph Carberry is a, a good example. He was someone who was a manager of one of the plantations. Um, and he opposed the sale, voiced his opposition to the sale. And when the slave traders came to his plantation um, to take people away, he encouraged people to run. And that was, of course, before the times of, I suppose, Frederick Douglass, right? And other uh, now famous Americans arguing against slavery. The church continues um, to defend slavery up until the Civil War. I mean, when there are prominent voices that are familiar to us, figures who are familiar to us, um, you know, arguing against it. Um, there were some, there's a bishop from Cincinnati, from Ohio, who ended up being a prominent, again, another lonely voice, you know, who actually called for, called for abolition, called for immediate emancipation. Um, but, you know, he wasn't embraced. In fact, he was, you know, criticized um, by his peers and by the Catholic press. You know, on the one hand, um, there was definitely a strong belief among some priests that a sale of people was wrong. The idea of owning people, though, perhaps not so wrong. Or, you know, we don't really know what Father Carberry thought. You know, he was, in essence, a middle manager in this kind of Roman Catholic corporation. He, he didn't have the power himself to free people. Um, but, you know, the, the Jesuits in Maryland owned people up until the Civil War. Was there any religion at the time in the United States prior to the Civil War that would not accept slavery and did not participate in it? Well, the Quakers, you know, um, are well known, um, you know. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting, too, because the question... Uh, that, you know, sometimes people think about is that, you know, the priests um, actually um, at times required the, the Black people that they had enslaved to attend Mass, to participate in the sacraments. And, you know, so at the end of the war, you know, what happens um, to these folks? Do they stay in the church? Do they leave? Um, is a question that, you know, certainly came to me. Um, and I happen to be Black and Catholic myself. So, um, and the really interesting thing is that, of course, um, in Louisiana, we know, for instance, that thousands of people left the church. Um, and even after the Civil War, the church segregated parishes um, in terms of seating, in terms of, you know, parish festivities. Um, but, you know, a lot of people stayed. A lot of people stayed. Um, and I think um, not, not only did they stay, um, but some of them became religious leaders and some of them became lay leaders. And, and what they worked to do was to make the church um, more reflective of, of the people that they claimed um, to serve. 
uh, more true to um, the ideals of a universal church. So members of this Mahoney family, for instance, descendants of those two sisters, you know, became one became a nun in Maryland who ran schools in um, in a couple of different states and one in um, New Orleans who became a mother superior of a convent um, and ran schools, orphanages, even an overseas mission. Um, so it's quite remarkable to see how um, they held on their onto their faith despite what they had experienced. Now, you found out about this, as you mentioned earlier. You didn't know about this. And when you found out, obviously, you, you got the idea for the book. You started researching the, you know, the situation back 200 years ago. How did that change your view of the church that you still belong to? So, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question because, you know, I am actually, you know, reporting on, um, reporting on this, um, researching, uh, reading these um, documents um, and um, these letters. Um, Archbishop Carroll in 1805 talking about, you know, expenses that they've got and, you know, what they should do is sell some, quote, unnecessary Negroes, close quote. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, it's bracing. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, the descendants of um, these two sisters, the descendants of this Mahoney family, um, they themselves decided that, you know, the church that they loved was not a church that belonged to those priests, um, those sinful men. It was their church too. And I have to say that, you know, in a strange way, um, it deepened my connection. Um, and really? it really that's, resonated. Yeah, it really that's resonated. That's not what I would have expected. <laughs> no, I know, I know. But you know, it's interesting. I, um, I grew up in Staten Island, New York. I grew up knowing a church that most of us know as Americans, um, a Northern church, an immigrant church, the church, my mother's church was a, a church that was largely tended to Irish and Italian um, immigrants um, and their, you know, children and grandchildren. And, you know, I, I didn't see myself um, in in the church. And, and so this history is a history of heartbreak for sure, but it's also a story of resistance and love and family and faith. And I have to say that that resonates with me. Interesting. We talked earlier about the what was going on on the dock and no, on the day that uh, the 272 people were uh, shipped down to the deep south and sold. How do you find out? How did you find that out? I'm wondering about the details. Was there a newspaper article written about it? Was some, did somebody write a personal, uh, a diary with entries about this? How did you find, how did you find color in the details? People were shipped in batches in a way. So some were shipped in November of 1838. Um, some, some were shipped at other times, but the story came to me in a very, um, in an unusual way. This sale um, was known by historians. Catholic slaveholding was known by historians. But as many people know, enslaved people have been almost completely left out of the origin story that's traditionally told about the Catholic Church. So I, I stumbled across this because a Georgetown alum heard about protests at Georgetown where students had staged some demonstrations concerned about some buildings that carried the names of two of the priests, early presidents who were involved in the sale. This alum said, okay, you know, protests, uh, name changes because the administration changed the names. But what about this 272? What happened to them? And he reached out to a faculty member at Georgetown who happened to be a member of a working group that was examining Georgetown's history. And the guy said, oh, they all died. And he was like, they all died? How could that be? Um, and so he went on to hire some genealogists and found out, in fact, they didn't all die and then reached out to us um, at the New York Times, reached out to a colleague. And a colleague was like, okay, 
a slave sale in 1838. Is that even a story? And um, luckily for me, she didn't delete that email. Instead, she said, oh, wait, there's someone on staff who might know. And I had written a book, American Tapestry, about the First Lady, Michelle Obama, and her enslaved ancestors and had some experience with archival research. So she reached out to me and I, I knew immediately. So, yeah, so I knew about the sale. I wrote a story about the sale in 1838. Um, that ran in 2016 and became kind of the genesis of this. And so, you know, you're looking for all kinds of documentation. Newspaper articles are certainly one of them, though there wasn't one about this particular sale. The Jesuits actually kept good records, though. Um, and so I mined um, Jesuit records, which describes, um, you know, their slaveholding. Um, I looked at um, newspaper accounts, accounts in, um, in Louisiana, mostly what you're looking for, sadly, is property records because people, human beings were considered property. So you're looking for tax records, you're looking for, you know, estate records. Um, and the priests too, um, wrote about some of these people. So you're piecing together threads, enslaved people, as you know, were largely um, barred by law and by practice from learning to read or write. So the kinds of things that you might rely on um, in writing about the 1800s, letters and journals, just simply don't exist. And finally, I want to get to Georgetown's uh, reaction to all of this. As I understand it, going on their website, they named a building after one of the, not Mahoney, that wasn't his last name, but Hawkins. Who, one of the 272, correct? Right. And then they've set up a $400,000 per year fund to fund community projects in the communities where the descendants now live. I'm not sure exactly what the criteria are beyond that, but... Um, do you think that's enough? Right. So what they had done is starting back in 2016, they committed to taking steps to address this history and um, uh, this history of um, Catholic slaveholding. Um, the first thing they did was establish that descendants of folks who were sold in 1838, descendants of Jesuit slaveholding, um, would be... Um, given, in effect, legacy status in admissions, preference in admissions um, to Georgetown. Um, they've created an institute, as you know, they renamed it buildings, and now they have this fund, um, $400,000 a year, um, that is designed to finance projects that will benefit the descendant community. Is it enough? You know, descendants are, are you know, there's a diversity of opinion among <laughs> descendants about this. I think most descendants would say that they want more. Um, on the other hand, it is certainly, you know, one of the biggest steps that a university has taken to address um, this history. And the Jesuits, too, again, with Georgetown, you know, apologized and committed to taking steps to address this history. Um, and they um, partnered with a group of descendants um, in 2021 and promised to raise $100 million toward racial reconciliation projects and projects that would benefit descendants. It was um, the largest effort ever made by the Roman Catholic Church in the United States to try to make amends for this history. Um, at the same time, it was far less than what some descendants had asked for. Some descendants had been calling for a billion dollars for the Jesuits to raise a billion dollars. And the fundraising, even for the 100 million, has been has been slow going. Um, and it's fundraising, not fund giving. In right. Other words, they're going to stick their hand out to other people and say, "Please donate to us." They're right. not. They do have a three billion dollar endowment. They're not taking, and that's small, by the way. But you know, Harvard's is 49 billion dollars. Right. But and that 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 point that you raise is a point that descendants do raise, like 
should should Georgetown be fundraising from alumni to do this? Um, should the Jesuits be fundraising the Roman Catholic Church? Shouldn't there be money just distributed? It's you know these are thorny questions that the institutions and and the descendants are. And, and other stakeholders, you know, alumni and other students have weighed in too. There's no consensus. But what is clear is that they are a part of what has emerged as a growing movement among institutions and municipalities and localities in, in the state of California, right, that are now trying to um, grapple um, with this history and to figure out a way forward. All right. Thank you so so much. Um, this is this is incredibly enlightening, and uh, really appreciate your time. That's it for this edition. Keep the conversation going on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and visit our website pbs.org/to the contrary. And whether you agree or think, to the contrary. See you next week. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Park Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. You're watching PBS.